Scientists in Sweden published a bombshell new report correlating low levels of fitness, increased levels specifically of belly fat, and guess what? Poor outcomes and increased odds of being hospitalized, landing in the ICU, and even dying from COVID-19. Now, this paper was not reported by any major media outlet. I looked at CNN, Washington Post, MSNBC, all of the major NPR, all of the outlets, and no one has picked up this story. In fact, We've been covering these correlations that, that have found independent associations with low levels of fitness activity, high levels of body fat, high levels of visceral adiposity, and so forth, that have independently correlated you know, those findings and those associations with increased disease severity, and no major media outlets have even covered this. I went to CNN.com this morning to actually check out on, the, on their YouTube channel, as well as CBS, ABC, and MSNBC. They haven't talked about exercise as it's related to COVID-19 at all throughout the last 20 months. Now, I was shocked because these networks ostensibly care about saving lives. They want to, you know, keep people out of the hospital. Uh, one life is too much. You know, these are the phrases that we're, we're, we're being told that they're not covering these stories. So that's why I continue to cover them, to empower you. You know, the holidays are coming up. There's Christmas parties, there's Thanksgiving, there's work end of year parties. And I'm sure you're gonna be getting asked different questions about the decisions you do or don't make uh, this year and beyond with regards to your health and the current public health problem. So I would like to arm you with information, with facts, with data. People wanna follow the science. Well, let's follow the science as it specifically relates to exercise and low body fat as protective modalities, as interventions that can keep people out of the hospital, that can save lives. So let's dive into it. I'm grateful that you're here. So to me, this is a bombshell paper. This involved 279,000 subjects, friends, and they found independent correlations with increased levels of underlying health conditions like asthma, like diabetes, like hypertension, uh, linear increases with the odds of having of dying, landing in the ICU or the hospital, right? Um, So really important stuff. But first, what I would like to do for just sake of sort of completeness is give you the background and perspective. Like if you're new to our channel, if you haven't been watching some of the videos that we've put out over the last 20 months, okay, with specific, you know, context regarding this very specific public health problem, and, and talking more specifically about how exercise is protective, I just want to give you a, a, a you know a five-minute, four-minute refresher, okay? This was really important. Last March, we talked about this, March of 2021. This was scientists in the UK showed physical inactivity was associated with a 32% increased risk for being hospitalized from this virus, from SARS-CoV-2. Yet, who's talking about exercise right now? Um, again, go to please go to CNN's YouTube channel after you're done watching this video. And you can specifically search within that channel, type in exercise. They haven't talked about exercise in the last six years. Like the last time they talked about exercise was six years ago. Six years. A lot has happened, uh, especially about our knowledge with regards to the protective effect of exercise within the last 18 months, plus even more in the last six years. So anyway, uh, what the scientists in the the UK found is that 10% of the hospitalizations due to COVID were linked to physical inactivity alone. They did a bunch of different mathematical models, you know, after adjusting for all these variables, okay? Again, where is that public health message? Now, you might remember the data that we covered in April of this year, finding 48,444 adults that were part of the Kaiser Permanente system, okay? Uh, What they found is that physically inactive people in the two years leading up to the current uh, public health problem, the COVID-19 outbreak, those people, they had a significantly higher chance of getting hospitalized, even admitted to the ICU, or dying from COVID-19 compared to individuals who reported meeting the recommended uh, daily uh, amount and weekly amount excuse me, of exercise, which is 150 minutes cumulative over the course of a week. So again, if you're following the data, why aren't you exercising? You know, we all have friends in our life who are double or triple masking, right? And who haven't left their house in 20 months, but don't don't go to a gym. They, they never exercise, but they spray hand sanitizer all over the place, right? You're like, well, do you not believe this data set from 48,000 subjects from California's Kaiser Permanente? I mean, th- this clearly showed with a very high degree of statistical significance that exercise is protective. Yet a lot of people don't talk about that. Now, I, I just, because we are going to talk about belly fat, We are going to talk about obesity and morbid obesity and how those are independently correlated per the new data from scientists in Sweden involving, again, over 279,000 data sets. But first, I want to make it clear that we're not just picking on the visibly overweight because there are many people, in fact, about 25 to 30% of skinny people who, who you look at them, you're like, oh, they're healthy. 
they are metabolically obese. They have fat in and around their organs, in their liver, in their pancreas, in their heart. It's called ectopic fat deposition. And specifically, uh, that visceral fat is independently correlated with increased risk for all these different diseases. But specifically, since we're talking about COVID, poor outcomes with COVID-19. And this was a, we didn't yet cover this. And I think this study is worth talking about this. And this is in the show notes and so forth. This was a systematic review that was published in June, and it found that five studies, you know, reviewing five studies involving a total of over 500 subjects, found that visceral adiposity is associated with severe COVID-19, while subcutaneous fat was not. So again, if you're a little overweight, but it's but you you're, you're carrying your weight, like this happens more so with women in the back of the arms, in the back of the legs, and the glutes, and so forth that subcutaneous fat doesn't garner the same increased metabolic and immunologic risk that fat concentrated in and around the abdomen does. So you want to pay attention to where your fat is being distributed and adjust your lifestyle, your fasting, your food, you know, all your sleep, your stress management, all of these things that can help you better get rid of that fat more appropriately based upon, you know, the intensity of your so-called interventions should should be commensurate with how much fat you have and where that fat is distributed, okay? Now, of course, you know that I've been critical of closing gyms, uh, as have many scientists. In fact, this was a study that was published in the International Journal of Cardiovascular Scientists. The title of this is The Big Mistake of Not Considering Physical Activity an Essential Element of Care During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And so, uh, uh, particularly for children, you know, th that's what many of these scientists are saying, hey, look, this was really bad, you know, to keep kids out of school and playing and keep them away from sports and so on, because the rates that they've become overweight has like more than doubled and the probability of them losing weight is, is not very high. So that was a bad thing that we, that we did. Now you might be wondering before we get into the study of again, 279,000 subjects, how can exercise like be protective against a new virus? That's what we hear. It's a new virus. It's a new virus. You can't do anything about it. Everyone's risk is the same, which is scientifically not true. That is a lie. That's a lie. It is scientifically inaccurate. It's a complete lie to say that everyone's risk is the exact same because it's not. Well, this is just an easy thing to share with your friends and family. When you're talking with them, they're calling you a grandma killer and an anti-science denier and all that. You can say, well, guess what? Exercise, it reduces the risk of getting the underlying health conditions, the obesity, the diabetes, the high blood pressure that are independently associated with poor outcomes. It's that simple. And that's, again, what scientists in France clearly state and share. And this image really sort of illustrates this. And I want to highlight this image. And these are the mechanisms, the biologic mechanisms wherein physical activity can improve underlying immune health, can affect and improve biologic age. And I want to hone in on a specific term here, cellular senescence. So this is sort of this uh, reproductive uh, gridlock or arrest that that advanced biologic age cells uh, undergo, this process of senescence that is characteristic of accelerated biologic age. And it turns out that many of our immune cells are susceptible to, which, uh, to kind of getting stuck in this sort of metabolic gridlock known as cellular senescence. And when these senescent cells become senescent, they released bio they release biologic pheromone, so to speak. It's called a SASP or a senescence associated secretory phenotype. And this attracts other cells to misbehave and become senescent. So exercise, and we're going to take a deep dive into the metabolic impacts like high glucose, how that impact impacts or affects cellular senescence. Later this week, a new paper came out and I want to share with you the details, but just put this on the front of your prefrontal cortex to get you thinking about senescence, senescence. I should think about this. I should measure this. I should be concerned about this because again, biologic age and chronologic age are not the same. You've seen the 32 year old that looks like they're 40 and they're in the hospital and so forth. So that is accelerated biologic aging and that can be part of the problem. And exercise really impacts that. Okay. So we're going to talk more about the study from Sweden involving 279,000 subjects. But first, friends, I want to welcome you back. Thank you for being here. It's Mike Mutzel. Grateful, as always, that you're tuning in with us here on YouTube and in iTunes. Look, if you're enjoying this content, there's two things that I would really appreciate you do that helps us share this content and also helps people like you who have similar interests. Please hit that like button. If you're not yet subscribed, please subscribe and also leave a comment below. You can say something like, hey, Mike, 
great study, whatever. Hey, Mike, you suck. I don't care. Just something is better than nothing. So just write something in the comments. That tells the YouTube search engine that people that have similar interests as you should see this video. Also, friends, today's show is brought to you by our sister company, Myo Science Nutrition. So like, you know, we care about getting at the root cause and of all things health related, helping your sleep, helping your stress management, helping you live a healthier life. So we've been working really hard behind the scenes to create an electrolyte that just crushes all the other electrolytes that are out there. So the new electrolyte sticks is coming early November. What's unique about this is it features real salt, not that USP sodium crap that's imported from China. You don't need that stuff. You need chelated minerals and also we've added in taurine and creatine. So this is a multi-ingredient combination electrolyte powder that's delivered in an easy to travel with stick pack. You can bring it in your car, your gym bag. You can load up on your electrolytes to support your body's healthy hydration response and exercise anywhere you go. It tastes great. There's no sugar, no added fillers or anything like that. What's unique about what's going on during the month of October is when you buy one box, you get the second box 100% discounted. This is a pre-sale that ends on the 31st of this month. So definitely take advantage of that if you take electrolytes because this brings down the daily cost uh, to under a dollar per serving, friends, which is great. So definitely check that out over at myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C.com, myoscience.com. That promotion ends on the 31st of this month. Okay. So let's really get into this. Now, in Sweden, there's this occupational health screening that's part of their uh, public data set. It's been going on since 1992. So data was extracted from this between the years of 1992 and 2020. Uh, and it's called the HPA, uh, Health Profile Assessment. And so what's unique about, they had all this underlying, uh, all this data from, you know, v- estimated VO2 max, they had body mass index, they had central adiposity or belly fat, they had waist circumference, they had smoking status, exercise habits, and all this. So they correlated and, and looked at independent associations with findings in these data sets and poor outcomes when it comes to COVID-19. In a severe case was a hospitalization, an ICU visit, or death. Interesting, out of this data set, uh, again, they screened data from 407,000 subjects. They found that only 857 of these individuals actually had a confirmed severe case of COVID. So uh, 547 were hospitalized. Only 172 made it to the ICU, and 138 died. Now, that the, the death rate in this data set was 0.03%. I I like to highlight this because again, you see the worst of the worst on the media. The death rate was 0.03% in Sweden. Sweden kept schools open, guys. They kept schools open. Um, They didn't do public mask mandates, okay? So for everyone who has these, believes in the hypothesis that closing schools and public mask mandates are essential to saving lives, you gotta look at what other countries are doing and see how that sort of jives with what you hear about on the television. So anyway, Here's what they found. There was loads of differences between COVID-19 cases and the control cases. The control cases were people who where they had data, but they didn't get COVID, okay? What namely these differences are higher body mass index, higher blood pressure, and increased prevalences of different underlying health conditions and greater waist circumference. Okay, um, these COVID cases, the severe cases in particular, had lower VO2 max scores and less favorable exercise patterns compared uh, to their counterparts that are aged match. Okay, so the authors go on to say, moreover, cases with more severe complications from COVID-19, meaning death or intensive care unit and so forth, had significantly lower estimated VO2 max, higher body mass index, greater presence of comorbidities, and were more often daily smokers. I want to share with you these odds ratios because they're they're really interesting. So uh, being overweight was found to be associated with a twofold increased odds compared to normal weight as per BMI. And being obese or severely obese was associated with a threefold increased odds for having a severe case. Okay, so that's really important. Again, especially when hospitals are overfilled. Why aren't we also promoting exercise? And not to repeat myself, but the major networks haven't even been talking about exercise. I looked at their YouTube channel and so can you uh, this morning. So higher waist circumference had a 1.75 fold greater odds of severe COVID-19 compared to individuals who had a normal waist circumference. Now, here's what's interesting. The presence of underlying chronic health conditions had the greatest increase in odds for uh, pretty much every additional diagnosis. So a 1.88 increase odds for just one diagnosis up to a 4.55 greater increase odds in those who have four to five chronic diseases. I mean, if you have four or five chronic diseases, man, I, I, I feel for you. 
that's you got to work on. There's a lot of work to a lot of things you got to improve upon, but but that's insane. So uh, surprisingly, daily smoking was linked with just a 0.6% increase odds, but high psychologic stress was associated with a 1.36 increase odds of severe COVID. Okay, this was in line with the CDC st- study that we covered in February, actually finding a high correlation with anxiety and increased odds of death. Okay, the scientists write. The main results of this present study include strong associations of several lifestyle-related risk factors, including cardiorespiratory fitness, being overweight or obese, perceived stress, and high blood pressure with severe COVID-19, even after adjustments for sociodemographic factors uh, in previous diseases. Among patients with severe COVID-19, those with more severe COVID-19 had lower cardiorespiratory fitness and in mutually adjusted analyses, higher cardiorespiratory fitness attenuated some of the risks related to both obesity and hypertension. So the take-home message is quite clear, friends. We need to be promoting exercise, especially for the obese and the overweight individuals, especially. We've been told, you know, oh, there's things I can't even talk about on, on these platforms, right? But- We're promoting boosters, but yet we're not even hearing about exercise. Well, what if these individuals could lower their odds of getting severely diseased and or enhance the efficacy of the boosters and all the different things that are being promoted by simply exercising more? My, I wouldn't have to talk about this if the media did their job and talked about this as well. That's why I'm so passionate about this. That's why you are passionate about this because you're frustrated. You're seeing so many people who have adopted new lifestyle habits. They're masking, double masking. They see you on the crosswalk. They see you on the sidewalks. They cross the street into traffic sometimes without even looking, risking you know getting hit by a car. But yet they they don't really exercise or they don't go to the gym or they don't even eat healthy real food or they feed their kid crap. But the ca- kid has hand sanitizer stuck on the backpack, right? We're seeing this stuff and that's why we get frustrated. So that's why I want you to understand that this data exists. We have data from the UK, right? The 32% increase odds of, of being having a severe case. We have the data from Kaiser Permanente, 448,444 subjects. Now we have this data. There's other data sets from Henry Ford Hospital where they had pre-existing cardiovascular stress tests and they found that there was a correlation and, and you know, with increased... Uh, cardiorespiratory fitness and reduced likelihood of dying uh, and having severe cases. And then also the data from South Korea, we talked about that. And now this data from Sweden, I mean, it's insane. The data keeps getting stronger, friends. So please help spread the message that exercise saves lives too. We got to talk, ab- why aren't we talking about this? We should be walking instead of driving. We should be taking the stairs instead of taking the elevator or escalator, all of that stuff. So what I will do is link all these articles that we talked about in the show notes and that I shared over the screen so that you have access to the scientific papers and just spread the message that there's more that we can do besides just washing our hands 19,000 times a day and wearing multiple masks. There's more things that we can do to lower the probability that we're going to be another statistic and end up in the hospital. So as always, I'm grateful that you're tuning in. Thanks for hitting that like button. Um, Thanks for being part of this movement of making healthy living great again. We will catch you on a future episode down the road. Bye now.